Welcome back to the afternoon keynote session. Um, always a great session to attend. Before I introduce our uh, keynote speaker, Norm Onstein, I wanted to kind of lay a little background. This happens to be a, a kind of a momentous year because of a lot of things that are going on, not only at the federal level, but at the state level as well. How many of you have heard about Cal AIM or soon to be named and renamed Cal AIM? So a lot of things happening in our state level around integration, and as I say, moving from medical care to a truly integrated health care. Similarly, we heard, heard this morning a lot of things happening around federal, uh, it, uh, going towards integrated care as well. We heard a lot about drug pricing. There is a lot at stake during this year as we think about price transparency, as we think about uh, drug, uh, drug pricing, as we think about uh, surprise proposal and surprise billing, and other things that pertain to it. If you work for organizations uh, that are you know, related to healthcare, always thinking about what the next policy change is going to be and how is it going to impact us. So in our organization, I work for Scan Health Plan, and as I said earlier, it's MA Plan. We are already doing scenario analysis to say what does this election mean in terms of policy changes for us. What would happen if we have a Democrat win? What would happen if we would have Republican win? How should we prepare ourselves and brace ourselves? At the same time, on a day-to-day -day level, uh, Medicare releases its advance notice where it signals the direction it is headed towards. It's heading even more towards a consumer experience-based direction, going back to the public sentiment we were hearing about, and also heading towards a more value-based uh, kind of a determination. So with that in mind, I'm sure you're all curious to hear about what this year holds in terms of health policy, and uh, Norm's going to sh shed a light on it. So let me introduce him. I think the biggest uh, claim to fame, I should say, is that this is his 23rd year of the 29 years that we've been hosting the Healthcare Forecast Conference. So welcome back. <laughs> Norm's a resident scholar at American Enterprise Institute. He's a contributing editor as well as the writer for The Atlantic and an election eve analyst uh, for CBS News and BBC News. He has multiple accolades that are in, in our little brochure today, so I'll let you read that on your own time. But I always enjoy hearing and reading and st listening to the books he has read, uh, written. His latest one was in 2017, I hear. The next one's coming up, and he's going to share with you what it, that's going to be titled. But the latest one was called uh, One Nation After Trump, A Guide for the Perplexed, the Disillusioned, the Desperate, and Not Yet Deported. Um, so more, to, and he'll tell you exactly, uh, it was a uh, number one bestseller on Amazon, always a good read, uh, and always a good gift for Christmas time as well, in the holiday time. Any holiday. Any holiday time, thank you for pointing that out. So, uh, lo looking forward to hearing from you, Norm, he also has chosen, he would like to take his own questions, so I'll hold you through to your time, and help me on welcoming Norm as well. Thanks. The only uh, thing I would add to that is I'm a very stable genius. <laughs> Actually, I know only one stable genius, Mr. Ed. Uh, but, um, and I will take my own questions, but we're going to uh, change the format this time. Write them down and pass them to the Chief Justice, and uh, he'll read them for me. Um, so I have done a succession of books on American politics in 2006, one called The Broken Branch, uh, about how Congress is failing America, a little prescient. Um, then it's even worse than it looks in 2012, and a paperback revised version of that, it's even worse than it was. And then the last one that you heard about, and when I've been asked about the next one, I've said, uh, we'll probably call it Run for Your Lives. <laughs> it's becoming more pungent now. So, an awful lot happening, of course. Uh, how many saw or read about the debate last night? Uh, so, I'm kind of depressed because before that I had put uh, all the Bitcoin I had uh, onto a Bloomberg Warren ticket. Uh, <laughs> my fallback was Buttigieg Klobuchar, so I'm really in trouble. <laughs> but the debate looked like it had been directed by Quentin Tarantino. And, <laughs> And I, of course, the highlight came very early on when Elizabeth Warren jumped off the top rope, body slammed Michael Bloomberg, put her hand down his throat and pulled out his stents one by one. 
and it was a very rough night for him. And my advice to him is to uh, basically borrow the Yang uh, platform and promise to personally pay every American $1,000 a month. <laughs> Maybe that will get his campaign jump started again. Uh, and of course, uh, this is all leading up to the Nevada caucuses, another caucus on Saturday after the Iowa caucus debacle where it got so bad that at one point they were thinking of calling in uh, Catherine Harris uh, to sort it all out from Florida. Uh, and of course, it's not just the Democratic race that we see uh, today. Roger Stone was sentenced uh, to 40 uh, months in jail. And we all have a question, which actually the president teased a little bit today about whether he'd be pardoned. I'm actually a little more concerned about whether the president will pardon the Houston Astros uh, <laughs> as a baseball fan. And meanwhile, some of the former Trump uh, officials are beginning to speak out. Uh, John Kelly, the former chief of staff, uh, did a pretty brutal analysis, although he waited more than a year after he had left uh, the post. And uh, as Jimmy Kimmel said, that's like a smoke detector that goes off after your house is burned down. Uh, <laughs> And then there's John Bolton, who's waved around his book, uh, suggesting at least that it could be devastating to the president, which means the two things that Trump hates the most, disloyalty and reading. Uh, <laughs> and of course, actually, Bolton's now made a couple of public appearances, and I think he's more like a smoke detector saying, buy my book and maybe I'll go off after your house is burned down. Uh, so where does all this leave us, and uh, what do we have looking ahead just a little bit politically? Uh, so earlier this month, we had an event that comes along only every millennium or so. 2-2-2020, uh, 2020 a palindromic uh, date. And it reminded me of a, an old story that uh, is actually uh, quite pertinent that took place on May the 5th, 1955, or 5555. And it's about an accountant uh, who got up early that morning in New York City, just restless, he couldn't sleep, and he looked out the window. And back in those days, uh, banks, he had a bank right across the street. It had a neon sign that flashed the time and temperature. It was 5.55 in the morning and 55 degrees. And he got up and broke his pencil, threw it against the wall, said, that's it. And he raced down to his uh, office, which was at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 55th Streets. <laughs> and on the 55th floor. And he began to work on his audit, and it turns out early afternoon, it comes out $5,555,555.55 on both sides of the ledger. And he jumped outside and hailed a cab and said, get me to Aqueduct, the race course. And so he drove out to Long Island, and the cab fare, remember this is 1955, was uh, only $5.55. <laughs> And a big crowd, a balmy day, and he worked his way up to one of the windows, and he said, took all of his money that he had taken out of his bank, $5,555, and said, I want to put this all on number five in the fifth. And then he worked his way down to the apron and watched as the horses came around the track in the fifth race. And of course, the horse finished fifth. Uh, <laughs> So as you hear all of the prognostications, beware of linear projections uh, about where we might be going. And uh, the fact is we have a tumultuous year ahead. And what I want to do is talk a little bit about that and what it might mean in the outlook in the next uh, year or two or three for where we might be going uh, more generally in a health policy. But then I'd also like to do something I did a little bit of last year, and that is step back and look at some of the broader pathologies we have to deal with in the society that are going to be challenges, whatever happens uh, in November, and that reflect another larger reality. And that larger reality is that uh, Donald Trump didn't cause uh, a lot of the difficulties that we have. They preceded him. He was more a product than he was the cause. He has been an accelerant. But a lot of the challenges that we face are going to be there whether he is president or not, just in some ways different ones, but in other ways um, more deeply uh, seated and chronic. So first of all, uh, for the rest of the year, you, uh, of course, have heard some about policy possibilities, including on drug pricing. 
uh, we are in such a dysfunctional environment in Congress. Uh, you know, this is day 1124 of the Trump presidency, or as he says, longer than any other president. Uh, <laughs> It's also week 165 of Infrastructure Week. And it'll tell you a lot about our policy dynamic, that in the one area where you could find broad bipartisan agreement, that <laughs> the needs are enormous, and that uh, it could have a beneficial effect in so many ways across the economy, and areas where you actually have uh, policy proposals that have been supported in a bipartisan fashion, and nothing. They have done absolutely nothing, and it's not likely to happen. And it is possible that we will see some movement in coming together on the drug pricing front, which would be the only area in health policy where you can imagine uh, any action being done by Congress and uh, laws uh, enacted, um, with the possible exception of some of the dynamics surrounding the budget in which the president uh, Basically, uh, Wendell uh, Primus and I were at a meeting yesterday at the Urban Institute with a bunch of people that's done every year on the release of the president's budget. There was a two-year deal that they had, including uh, a two-year deal that involved Medicare and Medicaid. And six months uh, after everybody agreed on that deal so they could get through this election process, his budget basically blows all of that uh, up. Now. It's not going to happen, but it also tells you something about the uh, paralysis uh, that we're in. And where we might see action here is simply because for Mitch McConnell, who you remember announced uh, famously in uh, early 2009, my number one goal is to make Barack Obama a one-term president. This time, his number one goal isn't to make Donald Trump a two-term president. It's to make sure that Mitch McConnell is still the majority leader of the Senate in a year when there are a lot of vulnerable seats up. And for many of those vulnerable senators, some of whom were mentioned in the last panel, people like Joni Ernst and Martha McSally and Susan Collins and Tom Tillis, uh, who decided, faced with the kind of difficult balance, uh, which part of my voting base do I want to alienate? the base of the Republican Party that will go to DEFCON 1 if I vote for witnesses in an impeachment trial, much less vote to convict him, or those suburban voters who went overwhelmingly for Democrats in 2018, giving them their majority in the House, uh, who are going to be upset if I just reflexively stick with the president. And they went all in with the president and now want to figure out a way to come back and create a different balance, which means showing they've done something and done something that resonates with voters. And the one area where that is uh, possible, I would say, is uh, being their champion on reducing drug prices. The difficulty there, of course, is if you watch the State of the Union uh, address, that when Trump mentioned the Senate bill, uh, we heard sort of in the background these chants coming that uh, were actually Democrats in the House standing up and chanting the number of the House bill, which, as you know, is rather different. So whether they can get through these coming months and actually make something happen, and from the perspective of Nancy Pelosi, who wants to protect her House members, remember winning a majority because they were able to turn a lot of districts that Trump had won because they got those suburban voters uh, coming over. The reason, for example, that she has put the kibosh on uh, moving forward with an impeachment trial of William Barr, the attorney general, who's practically begged for it in different ways, is that she does not want to have voters view this House as a body that's done nothing except go after Trump uh, officials. And while Wendell understandably is frustrated, as House Democrats are, that they've passed all these bills that are just sitting in the Senate, voters aren't pretty much aware of those and are not likely to be aware of those. And the idea that your defense is, look at what we've done, but it's their fault, just doesn't resonate too much. That's why Pelosi, at a bad time, went along with a deal on uh, the replacement for NAFTA. 
um, although she also did it because Trump at that point was so desperate to get something that he made concessions to labor that uh, made it palatable to Democrats. But it's also why there might be a common incentive to do something here. But we expect very little else. Now, looking ahead to the election, the debate last night was a uh, sort of leading indicator of where Democrats are, which is where they often are in a circle firing on each other. Uh, and it's a messy process, but it's a messy process that we often see, and often in a disastrous fashion with a party that is out of the presidency and looking to get in, and especially if there is no obvious slam dunk nominee that everybody unites behind in advance. And as I watched last night and as I've watched the other debates, it reminded me a little bit of the Republicans, especially in 2012, a little bit also in 2016. In 2012, most of the other candidates saw this as a race for the nomination to take on Barack Obama running for re-election as one that would come down to Mitt Romney and the anti-Romney. And all the others were jockeying to become the anti-Romney. And through the uh, critical stages of debates, they mostly went after each other because those were the initial obstacles. And they let Romney go off unscathed, enough that he then emerged strong enough to win a nomination. Uh, to a slightly lesser degree, but in a similar fashion, the same thing happened with Trump in 2016. Uh, and we're seeing this happen now with Democrats trying to find the lane, and especially now, to find a lane that makes them the anti-Sanders, who has the strongest coalescence of support, but a coalescence of support that's still barely more than a quarter of the Democratic Party right now. And last night, if you watched, there were some blows aimed at Bernie, but most of them were aimed at what all the other candidates saw as their greatest threat, the billionaire who has emerged from nowhere with this flood of ads, which are the most impressive ads uh, that we've seen in a very long time, and ads that have gone after Trump, that have moved him into a position to be able to qualify for the debates. Maybe he'll take the ads off now so he doesn't qualify for future debates, um, but uh, they focus far more on him. And you could also see with Klobuchar and Buttigieg in the same lane, uh, which is a lane of those who are less than 75 years old, uh, which ought to be the faster lane, but uh, going after each other with some intensity as well and Elizabeth Warren trying to emerge and figure out if she could place herself not as the alternative to Sanders, who's clearly won that left lane, but as somebody in between uh, the two. And you notice she also went after Buttigieg and Klobuchar on the health care uh, issue uh, in particular. Uh, but all of that left Sanders in a stronger position. And the nature of the Democratic Party's nominating process gives him some big advantages there as well, but it also takes a party and leaves it in a position where it is entirely possible that there will not be an outcome before they get to a convention in Milwaukee. Because every single contest is done in a proportional fashion, different from state to state. The California one, as you probably know, is one where the delegates are uh, allocated by congressional district and you have to reach a 15% threshold to qualify for any delegates. Now, what that might do for Bernie is if he has a broad level of support, which he has especially among younger voters, and in, say, 40 of those 52 congressional districts, he gets over 15%. But the other candidates spread and split their votes. In some districts, he may end up winning all the delegates. In others, he may get as many or more than another candidate, but the other candidates are going to be splintered. And that may be true in many of the other states. And we could see him emerge with a plurality of delegates after Super Tuesday. Now, I also would not rule out Bloomberg at this point, because most Americans don't spend their evening watching a debate 
although when you have one that's got violence and food <laughs> fights, it's pretty enticing uh, to a, a lot of people. It's like um, a few of the reality series, the uh, housewives of different places <laughs> join together in a massive battle uh, along with Survivor. Um, and, but most are not paying close attention to it and would not have seen Bloomberg's difficult appearance, uh, some of which may have been rust, but others were that he's got real vulnerabilities here. But what happens to most candidates who do badly in these settings is the money dries up and they can't move forward because it costs a lot of money. You've got to have people on the ground in different states. You've got to be able to travel. You need to have some budget to be able to advertise yourself besides just going around a meeting with different groups of people. And obviously, Bloomberg does not have that problem. And he can flood the zone with ads. He can make his ads, and he has one up today that's a pretty misleading one, but an attempt to uh, bounce back from the debate by showing pictures of all the candidates, the other candidates, as he asked a question about electability, all looking puzzled or looking like doofuses, <laughs> like deer uh, eyes, but in the headlights, but not taken from the answer to that question. So it's a little uh, uh, distorted, but that's not going to matter much to voters. And his appeal might still be there, but all of that simply complicates the matters because it divides up those votes. We have not had a, co a convention that went to two ballots since 1952. Now, people say to me all the time, oh, you mean we could get a brokered convention? No, banish the term. There are no brokers anymore. Uh, if you ever saw the movie which was taken from the Gore Vidal novel, The Best Man, with Henry Fonda and Cliff Robertson, very good movie. It's at a convention, and basically two or three people get in the what then really were smoke-filled rooms, enormous amounts of smoke, um, and figure out cutting the deals who would be the president, because they controlled blocks of delegates as if they were pieces on a chessboard. Nobody controls delegates anymore. They used to have in the Democratic Party something called the unit rule, where if a delegation had a majority that voted for a particular position or a candidate, they were all obligated to vote that way. And so if you had a boss in a state who could manipulate the delegate process, and this was, remember, before we had lots of primaries where you don't have that much control, and just get enough of the delegates to, get, to have half in your pocket, then you could have a big block of people, and you could go and say, you give me this, and I'll send my delegates there. Even the candidates can't necessarily control their own delegates. You know, if, uh, if one of the candidates uh, said to uh, his or her delegates, all right, I've made a deal, you're going to vote for Bernie. Half of them might say, no, I'm not. We don't like Bernie. Or they might say, I can't stand Warren, or whatever might happen. And it could be quite chaotic. And that is the last thing uh, that uh, the opposition to Trump wants or needs. The only good news for them coming out of that is that theirs is the first convention. It's much earlier. The Republicans are very much later on. Uh, but it's uh, uh, one that gives Trump some leverage or greater advantage here. And the other thing to keep in mind, especially as you watch pundits talk about electability and refer to national polls, the national polls don't mean much of anything. The national polls told us that Hillary Clinton was a slam dunk. And the national polls were not that far off. She won the popular vote by 3 million. What matters is only the polls in the half dozen or maybe eight or 10 pushing it states where we don't really know what the outcome will necessarily be. And that starts with the three that Clinton uh, lost by 70-some thousand votes combined, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, Michigan, uh, and uh, Wisconsin. And uh, it then moves to others that are potentially movable away from Trump, including Arizona, Florida, uh, possibly North Carolina, maybe at the outside Georgia. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the urban-rural issues a little bit further down the road, but what we can say is 
that the suburbs in Pennsylvania and Michigan have uh, become much more skeptical of Trump than they were in 2016. And the possibility exists for a more robust turnout of minorities in the cities, uh, but it's the suburban voters who matter. And they've become more suburbanized in those states. Wisconsin has become more ruralized. And there, the suburban voters were not so much anti-Trump. So Wisconsin is a very heavy lift this next time for Democrats. If they win Pennsylvania and win Michigan, but lose Wisconsin, then Trump could win 271 electoral votes with 270 needed to win. Uh, if uh, we uh, see Trump actually uh, prevailing in one district in Maine, uh, and, uh, or losing in that one district in Maine, we could have a 269 to 269 tie and with an election settled in the House of Representatives, uh, which is not a great outcome for us either. But what that means is you want to look at what candidates can do to win over Michigan and Pennsylvania as a starter, but then you've got to win something else. And presumably you want a candidate who could win in Arizona, where you have a, not only a heavier Hispanic vote, but you also have substantial possibilities for Democrats in the suburbs of uh, Phoenix and uh, Tucson. Uh, and through that prism, frankly, Bernie does not make a great candidate. Uh, now, the other thing you have to keep in mind is looking at how candidates perform in debates has very little to do with how they will perform in an election. It's a very good thing to watch. You want to be able to perform well. But by most objective standards, Hillary Clinton trounced Donald Trump in the debates. Where is she now? Not at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So you want to look at this through a different prism. Any Democratic candidate is going to have $2 billion spent to slime them, plus the equivalent in rubles. <laughs> depending on exchange rates. Uh, and look at the candidates and see who could withstand that more easily. Nobody can withstand all that money going after every one of your vulnerabilities and even making up stuff about you. But some are going to have a little bit more uh, of a capability to withstand it, either because they've been around for a significant period of time or because you have to grasp a little bit more for what those vulnerabilities are. And the problem with the nominating processes that we have is that these are not the things that are mostly under consideration when nominees are chosen. And this time, we may get a nominee at random. And who knows? We could even have a convention that goes through multiple ballots and somebody else emerges from nowhere uh, to win a nomination. I can envision somewhere after six or eight ballots and there's enormous frustration and nobody's moving the chant on the uh, convention floor, Michelle. Michelle, Michelle. <laughs> and then on the other side of the room, Oprah, Oprah, <laughs> Oprah. <laughs> it's like when David Letterman did that at the Oscars. And that didn't work out all that well, but maybe for him at least. Uh, anyhow, uh, where I want to go from here is to say that we cannot make linear projections about what all of this means for health policy without considering the dramatically different outcomes that we could have in November. So let me mention four. The first is the status quo. Trump wins re-election. The Republicans retain the Senate. The Democrats retain the House. Uh, now, if that happens, one of the things we're going to see is that there will be an accelerated pace of judicial nominations. And we will have hundreds of additional judges, all of whom have been vetted through the Federalist Society, and more of whom are likely to buy into a legal theory that would suggest, among other things, that the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional. Or that would make all kinds of rulings as you would get challenges moving up through courts and states and elsewhere to different parts of health care programs from the past that could create a very difficult and uncertain environment. At the same time, we know that 
Trump will push some other areas that he would like to accomplish but would be less likely to achieve. And that includes the long-standing Republican dream of block granting Medicaid. They'll push but probably won't get very far. But we are likely to have simply an accentuation of where we are now in terms of the incapability of our political process of coming together to solve significant problems, whether it's health care or immigration or education or climate. And we're likely to see a president emboldened even more. If you, of course, in the aftermath of the impeachment debate, uh, Senator Susan Collins and Rob Portman of Ohio went on television and said, well, we think he's learned a lesson from this. Um, I wouldn't quite see it that way. Trump has been emboldened by all of this, and we see that with the pardons he's just done, with the tweets that he's done, with his continual joking about how uh, including putting up a tweet that shows a picture of Trump 2020, Trump 2024, Trump 2028, the president for life, uh, and claiming uh, powers that are not constitutional ones. Uh, and he would be unleashed even more with the mandate of an election uh, victory. Um, but it would not be that much different except worse than what we have now. <laughs> Um, the second is that there is a, let's call it a Bernie backlash, uh, the worst case scenario for Democrats, which is a nominee, whether it's Bernie or somebody else, who ends up uh, losing significant enough support and voters that Democrats lose the House as well as the Senate and uh, the presidency. Now, I would say to you, having known Mitch McConnell for a very long time, and full disclosure, I'm not one of his more favorite uh, people. Um, <laughs> if you Google me and Mitch, you'll go on YouTube, you'll see him attacking me, um, which I actually kind of enjoyed. Um, <laughs> but I would say that the greater likelihood is that McConnell would then alter or do away with the filibuster rule for legislation, seeing this as their great opportunity to accomplish the conservative vision that the members have had for a long time. And there will be more of them eager to do that. And then you would see Medicaid block granted, pretty dramatic changes in Social Security and Medicare. And no doubt continued attempts to uh, come up with a replacement for uh, the Affordable Care Act, um, which they still have not been able to do. But more than likely what we would see is a continuation of a push for really cheap insurance plans without covering very much, all the kinds of things that would lead to, you know, a sort of patina of coverage of pre-existing conditions uh, which doesn't mean very much, you know, back to an era probably with uh, additional muscles where you're covered for pre-existing conditions until something happens. And then you had a nasal infection once that it didn't tell us about that's a pre-existing condition. And so forget about it. That kind of nightmare that didn't happen very often, but that would lead to some uh, difficult outcomes. Uh, still, with uh, what would likely be a significant public backlash, but it could be uh, a pretty tumultuous time. Um, now, I want to add here another factor, which is whatever happens more broadly, keep in mind that at some point in the next two to three years, could be sooner, we don't know, we're going to hit a rough economic patch. We're going to have a recession. And Thanks in significant part to the ginormous tax cuts that we got, we have no weapons in the arsenal at this point to fight a downturn. We are not able to use uh, the counter-cyclical policies that government normally has, which means uh, spending to stimulate the economy, um, which means cutting interest rates so that you can get things moving. Those opportunities aren't there, and it's likely to be diff, uh, deep and difficult. We already have really substantial deficits. 
that have not caused the kind of turmoil that we would otherwise get, in part because interest rates are so low right now, which is another part of the deep frustration at our dysfunction. This would have been such a great time to do a big investment in infrastructure when you could put out long-term bonds at a very, very low interest rate and you're actually making an investment in the country and its future. But what we're going to have is huge increases in deficits and debt when we get that downturn and enormous pressure that will build on especially those large programs that many call entitlements. And that's going to be a challenge. If somehow a Democrat got elected, I'll talk about that in a minute, and then the downturn came in the first few months or the first year, 2021, it could be disastrous for Democrats, uh, obviously. Um, the sense would be, even if the conditions were in place beforehand, that Trump got the economy steaming and then it went downhill. If Trump is still the president, then uh, the question is whether they would see the downturn with those large deficits. And interestingly, Mick Mulvaney, of all people, the president's now acting chief of staff and head of the Office of Management and Budget, told a private gathering last night that Republicans were hypocrites on deficits. They care about them when a Democrat is president, but don't when a Republican is. But you'll remember when we had the last downturn that Rahm Emanuel, the first chief of staff for uh, Barack Obama, said, um, a crisis is an opportunity, never waste an opportunity. And a deep downturn with those large deficits would be the opportunity to really make dramatic changes in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, veterans' health, and other areas. Uh, so that's just something uh, to keep in mind uh, when you want to feel uplifted. Um, <laughs> Now, the third possibility is uh, what we could call Obama redux, which is a Democratic president, a Democratic House, uh, a Republican Senate. Um, if that's the case, uh, then uh, very likely the Democratic president is going to find himself or herself utterly blocked and bedeviled um, because McConnell has made it clear that if there's a Republican Senate, they won't confirm any judges they probably will provide all kinds of obstacles for cabinet members and uh, others. Um, they will have courts that will intervene if the Democratic president tries to use the same executive powers that Trump has done. But we'll be back to the same kind of drift and difficulty that we had uh, after the Democrats lost the Senate. And if that's the case as well, uh, or if the next scenario, which is Democrats win the trifecta, what I would expect to see from Republicans losing all or most is the same game plan that we had that worked so beautifully for them in 2010 and 2014, which is we're going to unite in opposition to everything. We're going to block whatever we can. Whatever we can't block, we'll try and delegitimize. And then we'll find ways to get Democrats who thought that they could have it all, which these debates, of course, are designed to do with uh, uh, Bernie saying, you know, we'll have this great public movement and that will overwhelm them, and Warren saying the same thing, um, that they could well win a big comeback victory in the midterms and then create the scenario of a Democratic president with a Republican House and Senate. And while divided government for much of our lifetimes actually worked fairly well. In some ways, it worked better than when you had a president with thin majorities of his own party, because the two parties saw every reason to begin to work together. That's no longer the case, because we have parties acting as if they were in a parliamentary system, and that doesn't work in a culture in a country such as ours. Now, if there is a democratic sweep, that's where you have, if you look at the debates, Bernie and Warren especially, talking about how um, they would, and Warren last night, will change the filibuster rule and will just jam it all through. And Bernie saying that he would get Medicare for all because he would use the reconciliation process as we saw done with the Affordable Care Act, and we've seen it 
uh, we saw it done with the attempt to repeal and replace, uh, which didn't quite work, but also with tax cuts um, and ways in which you could overcome filibusters if those rules were kept. Um, if you know even the slightest amount about reconciliation rules, there is no way in which you could do a Medicare for all, uh, even if you have a detailed plan, um, while getting tumultuous changes that are actually going to cost an enormous amount in federal revenue that would not be allowable under those rules, but you're not going to get 50 votes in the Senate for that in any case. It's simply not going to happen. Nor are we going to be in an environment, as Joe Biden has said, where if he wins, the Republicans will have an epiphany because they know him and they'll be willing to work with him. This is all about self-interest as they see it, and the self-interest is no different when Joe Biden is president than any of the others. They're going to act in the way that they think works best for them for the next time around, which is to block everything. And he's suffering under the illusion of dealing with a Senate that was uh, gee, I didn't know I pissed you off that much, Wendell. <laughs> uh, a Senate that worked well when he was a younger man, um, but also where he was able to work with Mitch McConnell. But it was only because McConnell wanted, first of all, to really diss Barack Obama, saying, I can't work with that guy, but Joe I can work with, but also did it when it was what Mitch saw as in his own interest. And we're not likely to see many of those. And it's one of the frustrations I have with the dialogue and debate that we have right now, that we ended up last night for the umpteenth time having this discussion and argument over Medicare for all or Medicare for all who want it without any of the context of how are you going to do any of this? And it's not doable at the moment. Now, what you would have if there's a Democratic president and if somehow everything worked out well, and there were 53 Democratic senators, which means you beat McConnell and Doug Jones wins in Alabama, which is kind of pushing fantasy world for them uh, to the uh, edge, uh, maybe they would have enough votes to alter the filibuster rule. And in that case, we could see some dramatic changes. There would be dramatic changes in the political arena, the HR1 that Democrats have proposed. Uh, bringing in Puerto Rico and, uh, uh, and uh, the District of Columbia as states, campaign finance reform, redistricting reform, and a few other things uh, that they might be able to get done. And they might well, under those circumstances, be able to get a public option into what they would probably be able to do, restoring some of the elements of uh, Obamacare that have been uh, taken away through administrative uh, action. And obviously, we'd have a different set of people who could be confirmed uh, into positions uh, of significance in the administration. But if there are 51 Democratic senators or 50 Democratic senators, certainly a possibility if the election really went their way, you probably don't have the votes to alter the filibuster rule. And that means a long slog with a lot of things blocked and then a Democratic president who would try to use executive power in much the way that Trump has. And Trump has changed the dynamic here. What I would say is uh, fitting the uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan rule of defining deviancy down. But it's blowing up norms of governance that the next president, if there is one, will be able to uh, use to push the envelope there. Uh, all of this means and it's a message we know we've had for several years, that we can't operate with any degree of certainty or stability in a healthcare system where the federal role is constantly being altered or challenged in the courts through administrative action, through assaults by Congress on the status quo, through promises made and unkept uh, that make the lives of all of those who work in this field till this field miserable and difficult, especially if your mission is both to try and help people in their health care um, and also operate companies, hospitals, whatever it might be, so that you can keep going. Uh, and if you are a, uh, a profit-making organization, uh, be able to get a return and all of that. It's just a difficult, difficult time. Not that there are any easy answers to a lot of these questions, 
but we aren't even able to ask the questions uh, at this point. Now let me step back for just a couple of minutes and just talk about the deeper issues that we have. We know we are a deeply divided country right now. We know that a lot of the difficulties, dysfunctions, and issues that we have are not ours alone. This is a global phenomenon. We see it in Britain with uh, Brexit. We see it with the rise of uh, mostly right-wing populist parties in countries like Sweden uh, and Germany and Italy, where it's now the largest uh, party, and it's the same in Sweden of all places, uh, posing a challenge to fundamental governance. A lot of it driven by immigration and issues of race and ethnicity and religion that are uh, ones that are often bedeviling countries uh, to try to deal with. But we have our own distinct elements to this. I've talked before about the political tribalism. It's beyond polarization where you can say, we have a very different worldview, but you're honorable people. We have gotta work with you because we know what the problems are. Now it's your evil, you're trying to destroy our way of life, and if we work with you, we are betraying everything that we believe in, and that's amplified by the combination of tribal media, who can make a lot of money driving these divisions, and social media, bringing groups together and often dealing in deep disinformation uh, that mean that facts simply don't matter anymore and uh, don't become the coin of the realm. Uh, that's true at all levels and it's not going away and we know our elections are driven more by negative uh, feelings, negative partisanship as it is sometimes called, than by the warmth that we feel towards uh, those of our own and uh, that's not a healthy way for a democracy to develop. At the same time, we have to deal with the large and growing economic inequality uh, and the deep division that comes with that. And it's interesting that one of the uh, debates we're having now, and it's certainly a prominent one in the democratic race, is over the political money. The Supreme Court having said that money is speech, and that means if you've got multiple billions, you've got a hell of a lot more speech than the rest of us. And it amplifies that sense of inequality, that some people have more than others. And of course, the fact that uh, even though now incomes are starting to rise a little bit, for so many families in this country who can't afford a house, or sometimes with a, a couple of jobs can barely afford an apartment with kids, where you have two parents, if you have an intact household of that sort, both working two jobs, and feeling like the gerbil on the treadmill going faster and faster and not getting any further with it. Uh, people are a little more optimistic now because the economy has shown some level of growth, but the growth is not gonna be robust. The administration budget, the Trump budget, projects 3% growth for the next 10 years. You will not find anybody else who think that the growth is gonna be more than 1.7 or 1.8%. We're gonna be in a long period of slow growth. And that means people are not gonna be able to look ahead and see much greater and brighter futures. Just a little bit of positive stuff if they can get it. And when you have a top one-tenth of one percent that, is, uh, that views itself as victims, that sees the rest of the society as takers and they're the makers, that are pouring a lot of money into a political arena where there's corruption pretty evident in a lot of places. Those are the grounds in which you get autocracies developing, and we're seeing that not just here but elsewhere, but certainly we're seeing it here. Next, we have this enormous regional divide. And it's not just that there are red states and blue states, but within all of our states, there is an enormous division between the urban areas, the inner cities and the suburbs that are the economic drivers of the country. They provide two-thirds of the economic uh, growth, the GDP, in the country. And it's because in those areas you have the infrastructure and the capabilities of being able to work within the confines of a global economy and find ways to be supple and to move if you need to. And as you move out to the exurbs, to the smaller cities and towns and to the rural areas, the economies are stagnant, the jobs are not growing there, the areas in which they've been able to find strong support, 
coal country or others just aren't working so much. The trade wars, by the way, buffeting farmers in a fashion that they're losing markets and, and may not get them back. And they have lower education and lots of pathologies. And the tension across those areas has grown and is going to grow. And uh, it's uh, not going to get much easier. And we're going to have issues with it. But then there's also, finally, the structural weaknesses that we have in our system, a system that was built 230 years ago around a set of compromises that gave more weight to states uh, than to people, uh, to territory than to people, and that was built at a time when the ratio between the largest and smallest states in population was about 12 to 1, and now it's over 70 to 1. So I will mention a statistic that uh, is the most stunning one with its implications for governance. By 2040, 70% of Americans will live in 15 states. Now, they're moving to places where there's economic growth and vibrancy. They're not all uh, blue states, uh, but uh, that's where the growth is coming. Now, think of, and 50% of Americans will live in eight states. Think about the implications here. 30% of Americans will elect 70 of our 100 senators. And that 30% is not representative of the country as a whole. They're not representative of the diversity. They're not representative of age or ethnicity. They're not representative of education or incomes. And over time, we're just going to face a challenge of legitimacy. Now, what we've already seen is the high-tax states, which tend to be the blue ones, which were hit again with the tax bill that took away most of the state and local tax deduction, are the ones who are sending money to the poorer states. And the welfare states in this country are the Alabamas and Mississippis uh, who complain about government but get a whole lot more from the federal government than they actually pay in. Now, imagine that doubled, tripled, or quadrupled over time. And you're not going to have a lot of people who are happy about the outcomes. And it means that the fundamentals of a representative system that it's a republic, you elect representatives, but those representatives are supposed to reflect in an organic way the viewpoint and the needs and the desires of the larger public. And if they're not doing that over time, if elections don't matter, then we're going to have a crisis. And the same is true, obviously, of the Electoral College, which gets more distorted when 50% of Americans live in only uh, eight states. And the House itself, of course, both the ger gerrymandering that takes place and the natural patterns of people concentrated in urban areas and more diffuse elsewhere means that the House, which is supposed to be the most responsive, is becoming much less responsive to that larger public need. And of course, the nature of the House is such, there are such homogeneous districts that they become responsive not just to the people within their own districts, but to the small subset who turn out in primaries. So all of those are challenges that we're going to have down the road and challenges that are uh, amplified by another reality. If you watched or looked at the uh, uh, class pictures of the incoming uh, parties in the House of Representatives, the contrast between the Democratic class and the Republican class could not have been greater. The Democratic class now with this enormous infusion of women, of different kinds of minorities, of American Indian, uh, uh, Indians coming into Congress, of uh, people with different uh, sexual identities, of people with uh, very different uh, backgrounds uh, emerging, and so many more uh, women. Um, you saw a picture of what America has really become and then on the Republican side, it's mostly a group of middle-aged and older white guys, all wearing blue suits, white shirts, and red ties, um, and a smaller number of women, uh, in fact, and almost no minorities, uh, one or two that would qualify as African-American minorities, uh, still a handful of those who are uh, Latino or Latina, and uh, almost nothing else. And I mention that because 
We know that so much of our conflict is driven by race and by the dramatic changes occurring in the racial makeup and uh, ethnic make makeup of America. And we know about political tribalism. Put those two together where you have one party that is not just a white party, but a party increasingly of uh, non-college educated, more rural whites, and another party that is a more highly educated, but a party that is a coalition of minorities with some whites mixed in, and it's extremely combustible. And I will reiterate, all of those things are present, whether Donald Trump is president or not. It could be a whole lot worse. I haven't even gotten into what happens if there's a close election, Trump looks like a loser and he refuses to go. Uh, and I, they, you know, believe me, it's no laughing matter. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he made it clear in 2016 that uh, the election was bogus if he lost and would only be legitimate if he won. Um, but it's a more serious uh, set of questions now or if we have an election that goes to the House of Representatives where they decide by state with 50 votes cast and 26 needed to elect a president, these are not the kinds of things that we uh, bargain for uh, in our system. And all of it, in some level, makes the questions that we face and the challenges that we face in implementing health policy and helping uh, create a country where people get the services they need and want and are able to deal with the problems they have um, look a little bit smaller, but obviously they're not smaller, and for the public they're enormously significant, but it just adds uh, to those challenges. Now, I'm going to stop in a minute, but before I do, uh, I have an ad. Um, you have to pay a little bit uh, with an ad. Um, some of you who were here last year know that um, my family suffered a tragedy five years ago, and we lost a son after a 10-year struggle with serious mental illness. And through our foundation, named in his memory, we've done a documentary on a remarkable judge in Miami-Dade, Florida, named Steve Leifman, who's dramatically transformed the way the criminal justice system deals with people with serious mental illness, grappling with the problems of serious mental illness, which have grown enormously, which are a huge weight on the society, and a world in which the three largest facilities housing people with serious mental illness are the LA County Jail, the Cook County Jail, and Rikers Island. And what Judge Leifman has done is found ways to save lives and save money. And I mention it because it will be on PBS on April 14th at 10 p.m. Eastern. So please mark that date and time, and please watch and please spread the word. And with that, I'm open to questions. And the Chief Justice is not here, so I was only joking. <laughs> what about Tom Steyer? Can't he get another tie? You know, he's a billionaire. Either he's got 50 of the same exact tie, or he's got one tie. I don't uh, So. I'm a skeptic about Steyer getting anywhere. And, you know, to be frank, uh, we've had this fantasy for a long time. There are two fantasies in the country about our politics. One is an independent could ride in on the white horse and not be tied to a party or politics and be able to be a president who would do the right thing, which is not happening and is not going to work. The other was, somebody who could run government like a business. And uh, we've seen that now. Uh, and if you want government run like Trump University, uh, that's fine, but it's not a workable thing. You have to know something about governance and about how the process works and how to set up an administration and what kinds of people to bring in and how you negotiate with Congress. And, you'd hope we would have learned a lesson. And I don't think Steyer is the kind of person who, if he won election, would actually be able to govern very well. But I think there's also just enough of an obstacle. For it was an obstacle that obviously hit uh, Yang, who had some significant enthusiastic support from especially a lot of young people, um, and who spoke very clearly. 
uh, but couldn't sustain it. And Steyer's managed to build some early support in the same way that uh, Bloomberg has, by putting a lot of money into uh, states. And he may well be able to win some delegates, which would complicate matters even further by making it less likely that a candidate would uh, end up with a majority of delegates before the convention. But he's not going to win a nomination. And the other thing is, you know, the kind of platform that he proposes, which includes term limits for everybody, um, you've had the experience of term limits in California. How many think it's been great? Well, you know, for anybody who's studied political systems, it's not. Um, so um, I'm more of a skeptic. Um, on the other hand, if you wanted to give me a little money for my foundation, I'd, be, <laughs> I'd say he's great if he did that. Hi, Norm. Um, I wanted to ask, um, before we all drink hemlock, um, uh, just do you see, uh, it, it, since you're in D.C., do you see a talent pool? I mean, to, to have so yeah. many people who are in their 70s being the only people we could go to on the Democratic side, who do you see that you consider to be some of the brighter lights? So, um, actually, there are... Uh, we have a sizable number of people in Congress, including some of the younger and newer members, who are extraordinarily talented and, uh, and interesting. Um, a number of them in the House and Senate. Um, some of them didn't run for president because they knew it was a, a, a long shot and a grind. One who did, who would, I think, make a terrific president is Michael Bennett. Um, but, you know, somebody defined Michael as like the vice principal in one of those sitcoms about high schools, uh, uh, you know, Saved by the Bell. Um, no charisma uh, and, uh, you know, not much ability to captivate people on a debate stage. He started late because he had about a prostate cancer. Um, and I could find a bunch of those. Mark Warner of Virginia is an extraordinarily talented guy. Sheldon Whitehouse and Jack Reed, both of Rhode Island, deep, thoughtful uh, people uh, in uh, the Senate. Uh, Amy Klobuchar is very good and very talented uh, from my home state of Minnesota, uh, somebody I know very well. And there's a wealth of young women, and some of the women in the House, um, Abigail Spanberger of Virginia, Alyssa Slotkin of Michigan, people who served in the military or in the CIA, we have about a dozen of them now, women who have been in uh, the line of fire uh, in many cases and who are just really, really smart. Um, I think Katie Porter uh, from the district here has really become a significant figure in Washington, although some of my friends here tell me that she's struggling more at home. You know, what works in Washington doesn't necessarily uh, work uh, back here. And Adam Schiff um, is uh, an extraordinarily talented uh, guy who clearly has a, a bigger future, whether it's in the House or uh, somewhere else. I must confess that I'm finding it harder to find that in the Republican Party, in part just because of the nature of the recruitment process. And what's happened is, if you are a policy wonk, if you're interested in making policy, the incentives to come to government are just much less. I think it's been a problem for a long time simply with the nature of conservatism. If, you don't, if you're skeptical of government and you don't much like government, deciding you want to spend your career in government uh, isn't a natural fit. And so the talent pool is not always as great. Now, having said that, I've now been in Washington. I know you're not going to believe it when you look at me, uh, but I've been there for 50 years. And I've been immersed in our politics for, and the policy process for 50 years. And for most of that time, I worked as closely with Republicans in Congress as I did with Democrats. And when you had people like Barbara Conable or Bill Gratison or Bill Frenzel, um, uh, or even going back a little bit, Olympia Snow, um, you had really serious, deep people who wanted to make good things happen in the country within a framework mostly of limited government. 
Um, and they're just not there anymore. And the ones who have been there are leaving because they don't feel like there's a place for them. Where you still have that talent is in universities and think tanks. And uh, there's still people who are trying across the spectrum to find ways to solve real problems. But it's just becoming harder. And frankly, if we go through this extended period of complete dysfunction, the kinds of people who are going to run for office are going to be those who have a lot of money and it's just kind of a nice little gig to think about for a while, or people who are ego-driven, or those who are on some kind of an ideological or theological crusade. Um, and that's not a great phenomenon. And some of it is the money system. Some of it is the nature of modern media and social media. You know, if you go on, you know, if you're just an average person and you go on Twitter and you just read about some of the uh, others who are there, you can see how vicious it gets. And imagine if you're a public figure in public office and you have to do that in a campaign where people are going to be dedicated to stripping away your dignity and creating a set of conditions where you're a pariah in your own community. Uh, it's not like an incentive to say, I want to go and do good things for the country. And if we exist in a world where facts are fungible, where you can't even agree on what a problem is or what uh, data you can accept as common and then begin to work towards, well, what solutions do we have? Here's how I come at it. Here's how you come at it. Where can we put it together? If you're completely talking past each other, then we're not going to get it happening. That means we're going to have even more incentive to do things in the private sector, to work around the dysfunction in government, more incentives to try and make it work at the local level where there's still a little bit less dysfunction because the focus is on immediate problems that hit people directly in their daily lives, at the state level where it's become much more like the federal level in too many places uh, where we're deeply divided, or where you have one party so dominant that you don't get the kind of interaction and pushback. And that's, I think, a problem in California, um, where uh, the Republican Party has been so decimated that um, what ought to be an important voice, and a voice that also speaks for a lot of people in areas in the state uh, that are rural or more isolated, just isn't there or meaningful uh, anymore. And uh, that's a challenge we're going to have to uh, face uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, wait for the mic. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So the ACA turns 10 on March 23rd, and there have been two efforts to uh, de derail it. It's probably a good word. Two, two Supreme Court cases uh, upholding the constitutionality. And you were referring earlier, as have others, about uh, the, the Trump administration continuing to at uh, attempt to uh, make it unconstitutional. I'm curious what that really means and what component they'd go after to deem it unconstitutional at this point. So we have a case moving forward that uh, the Supreme Court decided, um, whether it was for political reasons or otherwise, to postpone until after the election. And it, the case, I mean, to me, is a bizarre one in a sense. After we had the last ruling that John Roberts led, of course, by uh, saying that uh, we could view um, the uh, individual mandate penalty as a tax, uh, uh, that meant it was OK and sort of did a little twist and turn to make it work. Um, within his own framework. Uh, then, of course, the Republicans, uh, when they took control, did away with the individual mandate and the penalty. And now it's in the courts saying, well, since there is none, then it's now uh, unconstitutional. It's a bizarre logic. Um, but it's a logic that's gotten a number of courts uh, to agree. And I would wager that there are at least four justices who would go along with that. Um, whether Roberts joins them or whether this comes up at a point when, say, 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg is no longer on the court. Um, and there's another justice, uh, potentially. Uh, we know that Mitch McConnell has already said that despite his rationale for not allowing a hearing uh, 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 on the vacancy uh, when it came up uh, when uh, Justice Scalia died because it was in an election year, uh, he said that if there is a vacancy at this point, even if it occurs after the election and a Democrat has won but before the inauguration, he'll confirm another justice. And that justice might provide a fifth vote regardless. Now, I think it's a bunch of judges who don't understand the implications of what would happen if they basically just wiped out the ACA with nothing there. Um, but we had a whole lot of members of uh, the Senate um, who were ready to do that in a reconciliation process when they really had no alternative ready to put in place. And it's quite telling that um, the Trump uh, administration, um, which said, we are going to have that alternative. It's going to be ready. Uh, when it came to the budget, said, well, we're not there yet. We're still working on it. So for 10 years, it's been, we're going to replace it. But there's no plan to replace it. And that reflects another reality, which is that the whole framework of the ACA, at least the larger part of it, moving to exchanges in a private marketplace with an individual mandate so you could broaden uh, the uh, risk pool, um, with a marketplace that could work because you would have at least some uniform set of standards so it wouldn't be like buying a mattress where you go into one place and you have no idea if you can do a comparison because the same mattress might be under 12 different names in other places, um, or where you think you're getting something in a plan and it turns out it's not there. Um, all of that fit the set of principles that were in the plan that Chuck Grassley and Dave Dernberger uh, and Orrin Hatch and others came up with as the alternative to the Clinton health care plan in 1993. And if you say from the get-go this is disastrous, it's the worst thing, <coughs> excuse me, since the Civil War, uh, then you can't put in the same conditions very easily and say, see, here's what we have. And if you take those away, you really don't have much of an alternative that you can put in place without deep flaws uh, that simply aren't going to uh, work. And most of the things that they've proposed would not fit together into a plan that would actually be uh, a workable one that would be acceptable to a whole lot of people. It's stunning to me that the Democratic Party at this point is uh, screwing its own opportunity to draw this contrast because it hits so many people so close to home. And by the way, that includes not just protection for pre-existing conditions. It's a yearly uh, cap or a lifetime cap. And if you go back and look at uh, what Jimmy Kimmel said on his show after he had a son who was born with a serious heart defect and needed multiple operations and had to be in intensive care uh, in the hospital at birth, um, that if there had been a lifetime cap, um, as we'd had before, this kid before the age of three months would have been unable to get health insurance for the rest of his life. Uh, so all of those things fit in as part of a larger package. And it, it's, there's no doubt that there are deep flaws in the Affordable Care Act and that it needs a lot of work and massaging. It's a reflection of the uh, dysfunction in our system that what used to be the norm, and of course this is just norms being blown up everywhere, that even if you opposed a major policy change, once it's enacted, you would do, because all of these, if they're big, have flaws, design flaws, or sometimes simply errors in the paragraph in the legislation. You do uh, corrective legislation in the next time, and then you try and make it work better, and you try and do that by making changes that both parties could agree to, and the losing party can have some input in all of that. And there's just no appetite uh, for doing it that way, and that makes it more difficult. And uh, we just have to, we don't know what courts are going to do now, uh, because we have a bunch of judges 
who don't fit the usual pattern of looking at precedent, of looking at law, uh, of putting it into some kind of a context. And some of them are on the Supreme Court, but a whole lot of others are on appeals courts now. And you have individual judges who can make a judgment and sometimes put a nationwide injunction in place that uh, can be uh, extremely disruptive. So we live in a very disruptive time, and have a nice day. Uh, thank you.